want a copy of the materials to take home. So in terms of our agenda today, um, we're going to start off with a clinical focus, and we're going to have a clinical panel going through different aspects of managing FA. And then we're going to go into, oops, we're going to go into more of the research topics. So we're going to have a whole panel discussion on clinical stage uh, research programs, so clinical trials uh, that are ongoing right now. And then Lane and I are going to give an uh, overview of what's kind of happening in gene therapy and gene editing. And then we'll have a clinical trial participation panel discussion. I know that's going to be very lively. And then the afternoon, we're going to switch focus. And we're going to um, have a guest speaker, Dr. Gan Dan Gottlieb. He joined us about 12 years ago. Um, so some of you may recognize the name. Um, he's um, an amazing psychologist and really does a nice job of addressing issues um, of the heart and the mind, especially when it comes to living with illness and disability. And Kyle reached out to him and asked him if he would join us for our symposium again, and he immediately said yes. Um, so we are really excited to have Dr. Gottlieb back this year. And then we'll have breakout sessions in the afternoon where um, you'll be able to go to two of the three breakouts. And those, um, you know, we've got short descriptions on the agenda for you, but you can learn more about advocacy. Um, we've got one that's going to be a peer-led group on emotional health, and then we're going to have another one um, focused on managing your care. And so hopefully there's something in the agenda today for everyone because um, we've covered a wide range of topics. And we'll come back here at the end, like I said, um, for some final Q&A and some wrap-up comments. I just want to take a minute to recognize our sponsors. Uh, many of them are here today. In fact, um, would any of, or any of our sponsors who are in the room, can you please stand? Because I really want to make sure that the community knows who you are and gets a chance to meet with you. And just thank you. Many of our sponsors are participating in the program today, but also because of their support, we're able to offer the symposium free of charge, no registration fee, and that's been an important goal for us. Um, we don't want to have barriers to, to participation. So we have um, a request of all of you. Uh, next month, we have the Farrah Energy Ball. Um, we are in high fundraising season, even though we had an amazing ride at taxi yesterday with outstanding <laughs> fundraising. Yeah. Um, we're not going to stop there. Um, we have the Energy Ball in Tampa, Florida, uh, October 15th. This is the biggest fundraiser we have every year. The Energy Ball raises close to $2 million. Um, and that is incredibly important for us in terms of uh, being able to fund a lot of research. And so we are asking any of you who have a few minutes today um, to help us by filling out a short postcard where you can just write a message to one of the Energy Ball supporters so that when they arrive at the Energy Ball, they're sitting down at their table, there's a little note from someone in our community you know, saying thank you, really connecting them to um, the help that they bring to, to our mission and to, to our community. So those postcards are out at the registration desk. If you just get one or two of them and fill it out, that would be terrific. All right, so before we get the first panel started, I wanted to let you know about a project that's been ongoing for the past few years. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, when things started to shut down, including clinics, um, I was having a conversation with some of our researchers and clinicians, um, specifically Louise Corbin in Australia. And Louise led the first effort to put together clinical care guidelines, and they were published in 2014. And I said to Louise, I said, you know, with 
nobody being able to go to clinic for a little while would now be a good time to update the clinical care guidelines. Do people maybe have a little bit more free time right now? And she was like, oh, that's a great idea. I've been thinking about it. Well, that was not a several month project. That turned out to be a several year project. <laughs> um, but very soon, um, within the next month or so, we're gonna be able to release to everyone updated clinical care guidelines. Um, and for those who don't know, the guidelines currently, the 2014 guidelines are on our website. You can download them. They're about three to 400 pages. Um, and they go through all different types of topics, but they're really meant to help you and help your healthcare providers navigate symptoms of FA and help manage those symptoms. Um, they are not intended for you to use solely as medical advice. They, they are you know, there to help your healthcare providers interpret what's happening for you and help you and help them help you um, manage through some of the some of the symptoms that come with FA. There was an incredibly intense process, and I will not go through this. I just put it here so that you know, like there's there's a very standard process where you review the medical literature, um, you look at evidence-based medicine to develop the guidelines. Um, and specifically the recommendations and best practice statements that come out of the guidelines, those all go through um, a, a detailed review process. And this year we had um, 70 expert authors from 13 different countries contributing to more than 15 chapters um, in the guidelines. And the authors were, you know, there are actually, there's over a hundred um, recommendations and best practice statements that go with the document. We also had, new this time, um, invited 11 individuals who are living with FA to help provide feedback on the development of the topics that got covered in the guidelines and lay summaries that were prepared of the recommendations um, to kind of help you get through this incredibly dense amount of material. And so these are just the topics that are covered in the guidelines. And new this year, um, actually from the patient community, we were specifically asked to consider a chapter on emergency room care um, because people will end up having to go to an emergency room and doctors won't know anything about FA. And so we have a whole chapter now on emergency medicine, uh, digital and assistive technologies, as well as mental health. The, like I said, there are recommendations. The recommendations really come from evidence-based medicine, and there's not a lot in FA um, because we don't have treatments yet. And so in some places, um, management comes from sort of what's considered best practice. This is what the clinical experts um, have learned over the years in caring for people. And so they're sharing their expertise um, in the guidelines as best practice statements, even when there isn't a whole lot of evidence. So that's sort of the difference between a recommendation and a best practice statement. We tried to make the guidelines much easier um, to access and is Anne in the room from the FARA team? There she is. Okay, so Louise started the guideline process, but quickly said, I'm gonna need help. And because we weren't having any fundraising at the time, Anne said, oh, I can help with the guidelines. <laughs> Again, we didn't quite know what we were getting ourselves into, but Anne, Anne has helped Louise through this entire process, corralling all the 70 experts to get all their work done, to get all the documentation submitted. And then Anne um, really poured herself into taking these documents and putting them into a website that would be much more user-friendly and much more accessible. Um, so thank you, Anne. Um, I'm not gonna go through it in too much detail, but there's a search bar. So for example, if you search the symptom spasticity, you get right away the five 
topics that cover spasticity in different aspects. There is a table of contents, and so you can quickly go through the table of contents and not only for each of the chapters, but every topic in the chapter that gets covered. Um, there is the emergency care chapter is on every page in red. So you can easily find it. There's um, navigation across the top of every page that kind of helps you move through each of the chapters and the topics so you can quickly just get to um, hopefully what you're looking for and just narrow down on that and you're not, you know, currently you've got to go through this 350 page document to find exactly where you're going, trying to find it as one single PDF. Every single chapter can be downloaded as individual PDFs if you're like me and you still like paper um, and don't like to navigate <laughs> on everything online, you can download individual chapter PDFs. And then the lay summaries and, you know, everything's right there. You can just quickly find what you're looking for. So this information is going to be coming out, like I said, in about a month. You'll get an email from Farah. Um, we're just now waiting for the final peer review of the paper publication to make sure it gets into the medical domain. So once it gets into the medical domain, we can share it more broadly. If we share it more broadly ahead of that time, then it won't get accepted because it's publicly available. So, um, but it should only be about another month. But I wanted to make sure you knew this was coming. And once you see the announcement now, you'll, you'll know what that's all about. So with that, um, I think we're ready to get the first session started. So if Dr. Lynch and Dr. McCormick can come up, that'd be great. Um, in our first session, like I said, we're gonna talk about um, clinical management and Many, I think everybody here hopefully knows Dr. Lynch uh, from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and the director of the FA program and the Center of Excellence. We also have Dr. Artie Patel, who's a cardiologist from the University of South Florida, and she's going to join us virtually. Um, there is a hurricane coming to South Florida, um, and so probably very good that she's joining us remotely today. And then um, Dr. McCormick from the Center of Excellence, um, she's a pediatric endocrinologist, is also going to join us. So with that, I will turn it over to you. Thanks. I presume this works the same way as they all do. <laughs> great. So can I, oh, I, OK, great. So I can see my slides. Many people have heard me talk on this topic before sometimes in this very forum. Most people probably don't need to be reminded that I have an international re reputation for speaking very, very fast. I will try and slow down today, but if you know you get into the topic, you just get rolling sometime. And plus, you know, we, we got lots of other things to talk about. They're, they're good to see there's so many new people. A lot of this will be review for some, but there will be other individuals for whom this is uh, new. So let's talk a little bit about free brachytaxy in general and then the neurological and other brain manifestations of FA. So FA is a rare genetic progressive neurodegenerative disease affecting roughly one in 50,000 to one in 100,000 people in the United States. So uh, one uh, 50,000 to 100,000 people, so about four to 5,000 people in the United States is the rough estimate, and then 15 to 20,000 worldwide. Uh, the usual presentation involves neurological events, either ataxia or spasticity, and if you have FA and live long enough, you will have neurological features. They are 100% penetrant. However, FA, we always have to remember, is a multi-system disease affecting a variety of other organs, uh, not only from a marker perspective, but also from a clinical perspective. There is genotypic, in other words, referring to the mutation of the gene, and phenotypic, referring to what people, how people manifest as heterogeneity. Not everyone is alike. The biggest heterogeneity is in age of onset, where childhood onset is most common and is associated with a more rapid progression. Onset is usually between uh, ages 5 and 15 in childhood, although it could go, uh, be at any age. And the mean, if you look, median, if you look across the large natural history study, is around age uh, 10 for age of onset. 
By late teens, these individuals or early 20s, they will be using wheelchair assistance and having issues with their activities of daily living. In contrast, late onset, which is sort of everyone after 15, but by definition, late onset refers to individuals who have onset at age 25 or after, is milder. And we can statistically show that it's associated with a slower progression and a milder phenotype, frequently lacking the sensory abnormalities and almost uniformly lacking cardiac abnormalities and scoliosis. So, I'll repeat myself at times just to be sure that people get some things. Again, it's autosomal recessive. Each parent is a carrier, but they manifest no symptoms of the disease. If people would like to talk details on why that has occurred, I'd invite you to talk to Lane Rodden, uh, as you sit with her at lunch or whatever, and she can answer them now better than I could. Uh, the prevalence, again, 140,000 in Caucasian, and a carrier frequency in the United States population of about one in 100. So as you look around people here who have no relationship to anyone with FA, let's say there are 50 within this room, w roughly one half of a person is a random carrier of FA, and they are occasionally discovered uh, coincidentally. Signs and symptoms. So remember, a sign is anything a uh, physician observes, a symptom is anything a patient reports. Ataxia, difficulty with balance and difficulty with coordination. Nice fancy word for something which is uh, relatively simple. Dysarthria, difficulty speaking referring to the articulation of words not referring to thinking of it. Areflexia, a fancy name for saying we tap on your deep tendons and they don't move. Uh, is this important? Only the neurologist, in all honesty. Uh, sensory loss, usually in FA it's mainly n proprioception, knowing where your limbs or your digits are in space and vibration, we call these discriminative sensations, and they sort of allow you to know how your limbs are moving, and thus they contribute to ataxia. And finally, muscle weakness, but the weakness doesn't involve degeneration of muscle as it much as involves the muscle not working right. Cognition is relatively spared in FA. You will read on occasion articles about cognition in FA. It's a tough thing to evaluate, and most of it is it's most important from a research perspective rather than from a clinical perspective. Uh, if we look at tissue from people, loss of some very specific places, the sensation in what we call the dorsal columns, which run in the spinal cord, the dorsal ganglion cells which give rise to this, I'll come back to that, loss of the pathways that take that sensory information into the cerebellum, which you may know is the area which controls balance in our brain, and later a particular portion of the uh, cerebellum called the dentate nucleus will slowly go away, atrophy. Most patients have some component of scoliosis or cardiomyopathy, but the severity varies greatly between individuals. And at times, the simply whether you call something cardiomyopathy depends on how you define it. A uh, larger number of people than uh, expected have diabetes, 10 to 20% early and then 20% uh, or more later, the later being more like type 2 and the earlier being more like type 1, though I'm, uh, Shannon will be nice enough to tell us we don't actually use those terms anymore, uh, but it's giving you a way to think about it. Uh, subclinical myopathy, that is to say people's muscles are not working, but it's very difficult to pick up on exam. You'd conclude it was something else. In addition, we are more and more realizing that people lose visual acuity out of each eye, and in some cases, this progresses to blindness. This is a major area for new interventions. And also, people do lose hearing, but it's not the ability to, let us say, hear me speaking here, it's the ability to uh, discriminate who is speaking within a crowd, going around the table, not necessarily knowing who's saying something unless you're able to read their lips, which is very hard in the mask era. It's a different type of hearing loss than you would see from cochlear disease. Uh, onset, the earliest patient I've met at, presented at age two, the latest I've met presented at age 75. People progress. On average, most people are wheelchair bound by their late 20s, and the really only cause of premature death is heart failure. If you're a neuroanatomist, and I know you all are, uh, and let's see if I can use the, well, I don't have much of a pointer here. The places that die are loss of the large sensory neurons that control that sensory information, vibration and proprioception. These lie adjacent to the spinal cord, and we've known all along, and this gives rise to difficulty with balance, because you don't know where, the, where your limbs are in space, thus you're off balance, and for neurologists it gets, uh, causes your reflexes to go away. When does this happen? Though we will debate the exact time, the answer is early. Some of us believe that 
all this is over before we even meet a person in most individuals. The second place one loses is the loss of the spinal cerebellar tract, which is immediately downstream from these pathways. It is also probably a very early finding based on animal models and actually based on monitoring during scoliosis surgery. You also lose, and this is something which has changed from the first time we gave this talk 15 years ago, the motor tracts which control the ability to move. Those that begin all the way up in your brain and go all the way down to the spinal cord to control your motor function. We note this occurs late, and you can measure electrical potentials or a motor evoked potentials, uh, as Suda Kessler has done in our group, uh, to prove it. But almost certainly, it is also present before people, we meet people, based on those potentials. So it's both an early and a late finding, and it does contribute to the progression in clinical phenotype and clinical abilities. You also lose the dentate nucleus of the cerebellum, which is a very small control nucleus in the cerebellum, which uh, gives rise to all the output of the cerebellum. This goes away late. One of the questions is whether it's dysfunctional earlier. I mentioned you lose vision and hearing to some degree. In the hearing, it's actually within the brainstem that you lose cell. In the vision, it's within the retina. Many of you all who have visited us recently uh, will take a snapshot of your uh, back of your retina to measure how thick it is, and we believe we can use this as a predictor of how likely people are to lose vision over time. Lane will be writing that, that data up after she gets done answering your questions from lunch. Uh, so give her a break here so she gets it done. Uh, relatively spared is the area we call the cerebellar cortex with the large Purkinje cells, although we think they may be involved but simply not die. They are dysfunctional but not that dead. That is important because dysfunctional cells are much more rescuable than dead cells, to which you would probably say, duh. Uh, and the cerebral cortex, where we do much of our thinking, is relatively spared. I didn't say completely, but relatively spared. So people have essentially normal condition for the activities of daily life. I will, uh, other things can be brought out in testing, but for daily life, people generally do fine in the cognition aspect. So it's a relatively few neurons, a few long tracks, this should be a disease which could rationally be protected events because it's not like Alzheimer's disease or Huntington's disease where your whole brain degenerates. This is a selective group of cells. Oops, I went the wrong way. So it is a multi-system disorder. We'll be hearing about cardiac disease, which begins as a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Your heart is thick. Uh, and then later converts uh, to a cardiomyopathy where your walls have become thinner and non-pumping. You'll hear about diabetes a little bit later. You'll hear probably a little bit about arrhythmias from Dr. Uh, Patel. I mentioned hearing loss and vision loss. One other aspect of vision uh, is that people have what we call fixation abnormalities, either what we call square wave jerks or macrostatotic oscillations. You do not need to know this. You, if you're interested, many of you have been told that you might have nystagmus. That's not true. People with FA do not have nystagmus. What that shows you, is most neurologists don't know how to examine eye movement, so you should basically ignore us. Uh, neurologists don't know everything, contrary to popular opinion. Scoliosis occurs in about 50% of people, 25% of people get it corrected. It is almost uniformly limited to the individuals who present before age 12, as we determined from our large natural history study, study sponsored by Farah. So we should give Farah a round of applause for sponsoring that study. <laughs> <laughs> Jen wasn't expecting that one. I gotta have something new every year. Uh, pest cavus or high arched feet. There are in fact a variety of different uh, foot abnormalities in FA. They're only important if they become important in causing pain. Uh, people late and even early also have very thin bones. Uh, this is probably part of the growth uh, issues in FA. Shana may be talking about this or not. And I think you all almost all know that fatigue no more explanation than that is a very big part of FA and can be quite disabling. Right now, there's no treatment to stop disease progression. There are ongoing clinical trials of small molecules and more advanced therapies, which you're gonna hear about later today. What do we do? Annual evaluation and supportive treatment is the key aspect. Echocardiogram, EKG, diabetes, scoliosis, of note, vision and hearing screen, physical and occupational therapy, of note. While I don't usually press people on this annual evaluation, I have met individuals recently who have delayed their annual evaluations and seen things go from manageable numbers to not quite so manageable numbers. So I would encourage people today to stay up on this. Notice on this you do not see 
see a neurologist, probably a tribute to how important people like me in neurology are. Uh, neurological therapy and what we can do about it. Neuropathic pain, that burning or dysesthetic, funny feeling that people get usually distal in their limbs can be managed. The best medicine is gabapentin, also known as Neurontin. Pregabalin is uh, perhaps better, but more expensive and more sedating. In the old days, Cymbalta, also called duoxetine. Oh, I'm not supposed to use brand names. That's right. Amitriptyline and amantadine are some of the other ones. Spasticity, when people have it, baclofen, uh, tanzanidine, and I will note CBD is very good at this as well. Uh, remember, though, CBD, while it's there, it does, it does have drug interactions. And finally, the one thing I will remind people of depression is quite treatable, but it's only treatable if people bring it up. I saw a person four to six weeks ago, he asked his parents to step out of the room, and he mentioned that he was quite depressed, and he said he was, uh, I said, I've met people in this situation before, and he said he was surprised because he didn't know anyone with FA who was depressed. I will estimate that roughly 20% of the people I follow are on antidepressants at any given moment. It's not treatable, though, unless you remember to mention it or unless someone brings it out. You can mention it to me, you can mention it to Kim when she's back from leave. Uh, anyone, just take action on it. Vitamin therapies, which many people use. Remember, coenzyme Q and adebinone improve survival of free ataxia cells in a dish. What does that mean? It means they improve free survival of free ataxia cells in a dish, which is a good thing, but it does not necessarily translate to human benefit. They improve biomarkers of disease in humans, so sometimes, but when we do clinical trials, we cannot prove that people get better. Remember, you cannot prove a negative. So most people logically elect to take them because they're essentially side effect free. Uh, I remind you, they can have drug interactions though. Vitamin D is something which we actually now tell people to push, not necessarily for anything that it does to FA, but for general bone health. I think they would say that most Americans are vitamin D deficient unless we spend all day out like at Rite Aid Taxi riding yesterday in that wonderful sun. Exercise is very important for people with FA. We have noticed this during the pandemic. People who stop exercising simply do worse. Doing an exercise, what it is, is different to different people. The less you do, the less you do. It maintains abilities, and it is a very key feature to uh, fighting against depression. That has been shown in many studies. The specific benefits in FA are two. First, it does induce a process called mitophagy or mitochondrial pruning, where you re recall that FA is a mitochondrial disease in some ways. Uh, exercise makes you get rid of your bad mitochondria and keep your good ones. It's an endogenous process mediated by a transcription factor, which you can talk about if we want. Uh, the second thing is your cerebellum itself works on a training mechanism. If someone lies down for a week, their cerebellum will come untrained and they will be off balance. So the more you do, the, you're always retraining it. If you stop doing anything, that training goes away. Two other questions which are not neurologic, but I'll take now because I don't think they come up elsewhere. I'm asked very frequently about taking supplemental iron. If you recall when the gene was discovered in the early studies, we discovered that my iron builds up in the mitochondria of people with FA. That led to an overall worry that people shouldn't take iron. Well, better understanding is that the iron may be an epiphenomenon, something which is there but isn't contributing. At the very least, people with FA are actually iron deficient at the whole body level, though iron concentrated in the mitochondria. So you can't simply treat the disease by restricting iron. It won't work. You'll just program yourself back. So if a person, and if you look at uh, people's blood values, everyone has low ferritins, People tend to be mildly anemic, not in a range which causes problem, but in a range which you know it's real. And they have an anemia which is clearly iron deficiency based on the size of the red cells. So people with FA are mildly iron deficient. Is it necessary to treat? Usually not. But if a person falls below a certain number, which is judgment based on your physician, it's reasonable to treat with oral iron. You don't have to take away all the, go for the multivitamins which have no iron. That amount is not enough to cause problem. I will cautiously say IV iron may be different so when they try and replete someone right away. I am familiar with one or two people who may have had complications when being repleted with IV iron, but oral iron is quite safe and no one should be scared to take maintenance. The second question from every week is COVID. So we'll we're not gonna talk politics, we'll talk data. 
Uh, we've seen 110 patients with COVID among the last 400 FA patients we've seen, which is the number we have seen as of beginning of last week uh, since the pandemic began. 10 people have been hospitalized, nine of those people were unvaccinated. unvaccinated. Two people have died, both were unvaccinated, both had diabetes. So the takeaway message, COVID is probably very similar in people with FA than the general population, older people and people who are diabetic, like at least one person on this stage, and Shane is quite young. Uh, so if you're diabetic and you're old like me, stay vaccinated. And in general, stay vaccinated. Clearly, it does protect against more severe disease. And as I say, no one has died since the vaccination era among FA patients. Does long COVID exist in FA? I don't even know how to address this one because as you know, people with FA frequently have slow recovery from any virus. How do we assess that with COVID? It would be a very, just a very hard thing to do. Uh, vaccination. There have been very few reactions, a few people who have very bad disease, ejection fractions in the single digit range or less than 15% from the metabolic stress. They've had a very bad week afterward. Again, that probably would have happened with any vaccination. It was not unique to COVID. Uh, so I can't say that I'm certain anyone's had a vaccination reaction. I would be very careful about tossing around the term myocarditis, which is given for a uh, very one in 10,000 or some number of individuals who get the COVID vaccination. Many people with FA, particularly children, have high troponins all the time. They have chest pain sometimes. They have cardiac MRI scans, which show what we call late gadolinium enhancement, which is the marker of fibrosis. Those are the three markers of FA, and they're the three markers of uh, myocarditis. So you actually can't tell whether a person with FA has myocarditis or not, because they met many of the criteria before they got anything. So I think there's a lot of conjecture about this, which is unproven. Overall conclusion, COVID and COVID vaccination are no different in FA than the rest of the population. So treat that as you would have treated it. Questions? Or do I take questions later? Question now, anyone? Or did I actually speak so slow that everyone got everything? That gets a laugh. <laughs> Norm, yes. So on the long nerve tracts, so the children are small, they seem to be less ataxic, and as they grow, we know that that tract grows. But at some point, does it stabilize, or does it pro continue to progress? So the question is whether the tracts stop growing. We th so the answer is we don't know that for sure. I would note the simple act of growth does a couple things. As you go through the growth per period, your scoliosis worsens. And if your center of balance is not as well defined, you will be more ataxic. I could produce that in any person in this room, even without a neurologic disease. So that's one thing. Normally, you're, you're, we think of uh, cells in FA as being the cell body, neuro, uh, which is the, the uh, place where the nucleus is in a neuron, driving it. And then it's a dying back as the cell body dies. So it's not a growth-related phenomenon. Now. If there is a bioenergetic issue, as you might find in a mitochondrial disease, then you would expect that the most likely to be affected neurons in FA are the ones with their longest axons, which are that one which begins in the cortex and goes down to the lower part of your back, which is about a meter long, and then the one which goes from your back all the way out to your feet. There's a little bit of here, because motor neurons, which are the other long one, they don't die. So it's not simply length, although length could be a contributor. Uh, in back, I can't, uh, looks like uh, Tiffany's mom. Joan. Thank you. Uh, can you tell us more about the, um, what you recommended for the fatigue Amantadine. Amantadine. Okay, so fatigue is a—it's an unusual symptom. It's very hard to describe. It involves uh, muscle, perhaps cardiac disease, neurologic features as well as psychological. Some, in, when people have fatigue, I do try and maximize their coenzyme Q and adenosine on the possibility that you're acting directly at muscle. 
The other thing is to get rid of anything which is, might be fatiguing, which is unfortunately some of those other medicines we use, baclofen, uh, gabapentin, they make people sleepy. But then there's a drug called amantadine, which in multiple sclerosis is independently shown to improve the symptom of fatigue. It doesn't necessarily affect any of the individual neurological subcomponents, but it does work on fatigue. I'll say some people have seemed to respond to it. It is not a sedating medicine. It's a safe medicine. It was originally designed to keep you from getting the flu. It does not do that. I would recommend a flu vaccine for that. But then it crossed over to Parkinson's disease, and it's, it's, a, it's a useful for some very minor components of Parkinson's disease. Not minor, it's dyskinesis only. Uh, but then in the MS world, they found that it helped on fatigue, and it's crossed over to many other diseases for that. I will also note fatigue can be a very largely psychological and or symptom of depression. Yeah, and how much do you recommend? 100 milligrams a day for amantadine. You can't go any higher than 300. It tends to make people's, it can make people's feet swell a little bit. Uh, it doesn't a big deal. It's not cardiac, it just makes them swell. And you can get this funny pattern called livido reticularis on your feet. But you know, if you wear socks, it doesn't make a difference. Thank you. Sure, that's fine. Do you want me to introduce? Oh, okay, I'm introducing her. Fair enough. Okay, very good. So now we're going to cross over to the online component of this uh, session. So uh, we have the privilege of welcoming Dr. Arthi Patel from the University of South Florida today. She's a cardiologist who sees many FA patients, and I've had the chance to work with her on several advisory boards. So now we're going to go over to Arthi, and we're going to remove all pinned videos. So. Go ahead, say something Hi. so we can hear you. Good morning. Good. Volume okay? Good to go. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lynch. Very good. For the introduction. And I want to thank Farah and the organizers at CHOP for inviting me to give this very important talk on the clinical management of uh, cardiovascular disease in Friedrich's ataxia. So there's a little bit of ground to cover. So I'm going to uh, jump right in and get started. So what I hope to accomplish today is just a brief overview of heart disease and Friedrich's ataxia. Uh, Dr. Lynch uh, touched on it a little bit and we'll talk a little bit more about it. And then we'll jump into the management of heart disease and also some, a review of some of the diagnostic testing that we perform in uh, FA, uh, just so that when you do visit your physician, your cardiology provider, you can feel empowered about what is being performed and the answers that we can get. So the heart in Friedrich's ataxia is important because a lot of people, a majority of people with FA will develop some evidence of heart disease. And this is identified by either um, ventricular hypertrophy um, or abnormal heart rhythms that we detect on EKG. So just as with neurologic um, component of FA, the basis of heart disease is decreased for taxin. There are several proposed theories. It is um, a little bit unclear, um, but the proposed mechanisms for heart involvement include iron accumulation dysfunction, um, iron clustering, um, mitochondrial dysfunction and proliferation, oxidative stress and inflammation. All of those theories um, we think contribute in some way, but what we do know that is clear is that 90% of people with Friedrich's ataxia will show clinical evidence of heart disease, either through symptoms or cardiac testing. And 60% of them in particular will develop something called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So what is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? So hypertrophy means thickened heart muscle. And um, basically you have um, a muscle cell abnormality that develops over years causing thickened uh, heart disease. So the hypertrophy can progress from thickened to eventual thinning of the heart muscle. And when this happens, we call it a dilated cardiomyopathy. And this can be associated with low heart function. Um, we identify uh, hypertro hy hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, dilated cardiomyopathy through a series of specific cardiac tests, um, echocardiograms, cardiac MRIs. And with the depiction here, of the picture, you can see that this wall thickening, this is normal. And then in a hypertrophied heart, you can see that it is thickened. So that's simply what we're measuring when we diagnose hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. 
So we've already established that heart disease is important because it's, it's very common in patients with FA, but we also think it's important because it is a increased cause of mortality in patients uh, with Friedrich's ataxia. So 59% um, occurring between the ages of 16 to 30 most commonly. Um, that was a, a study by Dr. Sue from 2011 recognized this. So you might be asking, when is the right time to get my heart checked? So evaluation should really start soon after you're diagnosed with FA. Um, what you can expect is to have a screening at your first visit, and we recommend having surveillance cardiac, specifically for cardiac disease, every year. You should follow up sooner if you have any heart symptoms in between that time. And um, you're speaking to a cardiologist who I would like to see all you know, patients with FA, but absolutely you should see a cardiac specialist for any abnormal testing that suggests you have heart disease or if you have any symptoms. So at a cardiology visit, you can expect to get a thorough history, examination, and then any pertinent diagnostic testing depending on what stage of cardiology visit you're in. So in terms of screening, the history will include a thorough family and social history looking for risk factors for heart disease. And then we also look for diabetes, high blood pressure, and cholesterol, um, which are also risk factors for developing heart disease. A thorough examination is performed. Um, and then lastly, at baseline, we like to uh, perform some diagnostic tests, including an EKG and echo, which we'll talk about a little bit more later, um, and then some lab work. If everything looks okay at screening, we move on to annual surveillance. And at those visits, we will evaluate for new symptoms. Again, a thorough examination is performed. And then we perform diagnostic testing to sort of update the baseline tests that were performed. So typical things that we'll talk about at visits um, that um, are specific to the heart are we ask if people are having chest pain, shortness of breath, heart racing or pounding, which is called palpitations, dizziness, um, passing out, or leg swelling, which is called edema. Now, as Dr. Lynch uh, mentioned, similar to the um, symptom of fatigue, a lot of these symptoms can be non-heart related as well. So it's important to be evaluated by your primary care doctor, neurologist, or cardiologist so we can identify if they're heart related, but if not, we can identify the other organ systems involved and provide treatment for that. So one of the most common uh, symptoms in FA is chest pain. In the general population, chest pain is largely attributed um, or a high percentage to coronary artery disease. The coronary arteries are large vessels in the heart that provide blood flow to the muscle and are considered a macrovascular disease. This is not often the cause of chest pain in people with Friedrich's ataxia. In Friedrich's ataxia, we look at microvascular disease, and this is the imbalance of the oxygen and blood supply coming to the heart um, and the overwhelming demand that the heart has for this. So um, if you've made it through screening, now we're on to annual surveillance. If you do have any signs or symptoms of heart disease like we described, we recommend early follow-up. And in my practice, we have very symptom-driven evaluation and testing. We don't order a lot of tests. We try and keep it very concise so that we can identify exactly what's going on. So for chest pain, this may include an additional to your EKG and echo, maybe a stress test or a CT scan. If you're having palpitations, maybe monitoring that um, with a monitor, an ambulatory monitor. Um, and if you have shortness of breath or swelling, evaluating for fluid retention and, and heart failure. So I wanted to briefly talk about the cardiac testing that we perform in Friedrich's ataxia, just so that um, it's uh, not so overwhelming and you can feel empowered when you visit your cardiology provider about what they're doing. So the most common test that we perform is the EKG or the electrocardiogram. It detects abnormal heart rhythms and is really a snapshot um, six second snapshot of what your conduction system looks like. So it can identify atrial arrhythmias, which form from the top chambers of the heart, or ventricular arrhythmias, which are from the bottom part of the heart. The atrial arrhythmias are more common in uh, people with Friedrich's ataxia. 
We can also use, in contrast to the snapshot, we can use ambulatory monitors to monitor people from anywhere from 24 hours all the way up to three years. So this silver device here is called a loop monitor and can be placed underneath the skin for identification of arrhythmias, um, both atrial ventricular arrhythmias and conduction abnormalities. Probably, um, arguably, the second most common um, study performed in evaluation of the heart is called the echocardiogram. This is simply an ultrasound of the heart. And here you can see the heart moving. We're able to identify wall thickening here and take a look at our heart valves. Um, the echo evaluates overall structure and function, and in particular gives us one of the major pieces of information uh, that is helpful in identifying how healthy the heart is, which is the ejection fraction. So this number tells us the amount of blood that is ejected from the heart with each heartbeat. So you would think 100% would be normal, but it's actually about 50%, 50 to 55%. So you'll see this number reported on every echocardiogram. In addition to that, we get information about wall thickness that helps us diagnose hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or dilated cardiomyopathy. We get to look at the valves and we get to make very specific calculations um, regarding other parameters in the heart, including diastology and strain, which can give us information about heart disease even before the ejection fraction is abnormal. Um, next is cardiac MRI, uh, probably the third most often ordered exam in FA. It, I like to think of it as an echocardiogram with a lot of extra information. We're able to get everything we can from an echo, look at the valves, look at heart function, look at wall thickness, but we also get, as Dr. Lynch touched on, the idea of if there's fibrosis or scar in the heart muscle. So that's identified by this stripe of white here, this patchiness of white here, and then this mosaic color in this map here. So fibrosis and scar um, is one parameter that we use in assessing cardiomyopathy in patients with FA. Lastly, in identifying coronary artery disease, we do two studies, which is coronary CT, can help us look at anatomy of the heart and plaques, blood flow of the arteries, and then stress testing, which doesn't directly visualize the vessels, but we can look at blood flow to the heart during exercise and with medication. So in addition to the array of diagnostic tests that we can perform, when you go to the um, cardiologist or your provider, um, at baseline and annually should be screening for cardiovascular risk. And I know Dr. McCormick's gonna talk a little bit about diabetes, but we like to screen for with hemoglobin A1C, a lipid panel to detect high cholesterol, and then um, complete blood counts and metabolic panels to evaluate for liver or kidney disease. There's very specific cardiac biomarkers, um, including troponin and BNP that are, um, have been studied in Friedrich's ataxia. So troponin is a protein that regulates contractions in the heart. It's in the general population is released during stress or injury to the heart, and we can measure this with um, a blood test. So in patients with Friedrich's ataxia, we, we know that this may represent chronic or ongoing injury. Um, there have been two studies that have looked at this previously. Um, what's interesting about the presence of troponin is that it's um, evident in about 47% of people or up to 47% of people, but they can be completely asymptomatic. Um, a follow-up study showed that 34% of people with FA had increased troponin and that it might be associated with increased wall thickness. Again, a lot of work um, to find a clear association with what troponin means in terms of development of cardiac disease and long-term monitoring. Um, BNP or B-type natriuretic peptide. Uh, this is a hormone that's released by the heart in response to stretch. So you can get stretching of the heart wall and the vessels in response to fluid retention or heart failure. Um, the BNP is released to help um, mitigate fluid retention and regulate blood pressure. We know that in 14% of patients, it can be elevated. It can be associated with very discrete echo parameters, but again, there's not it doesn't tell us a lot about if people absolutely um, develop heart failure or what that means um, in our patients who don't have any symptoms at all. So once we've um, uh, reviewed symptoms, done the appropriate testing, then we identify if people have heart dysfunction or not 
and offer a management treatment. So if you have no symptoms and have a normal heart function, there is no recommendation currently for um, starting heart medications. If you do have cardiomyopathy with low ejection fraction, um, there is, here's the list of medications that we often recommend. Now these have not been exclusively, or all of them have not been exclusively studied in Friedrich's ataxia, but we know from other cardiomyopathies that these can help or prevent, or slow the progression of cardiomyopathy, improve ejection fraction. So we are generalizing what we know about cardiomyopathies in other patients to patients with Friedrich's ataxia. Um, if you have an abnormal heart rhythm, uh, there are medications that we can use to help that. Um, we often refer to a rhythm specialist called an electrophysiologist for specialized procedures if um, they are indicated. Lastly, if you have cardiac risk factors such as blood pressure, diabetes, and high cholesterol, we know from the general population that these do increase risk of cardio cardiac disease. So these, it is absolutely important that these are under control and medications are started um, to target these. So lastly, I want to talk about um, when, as an FA patient, what your other healthcare providers should know about your heart. This becomes especially important if you're undergoing major surgery and receiving anesthesia, or if you are receiving multiple medications from other pres prescribers and are on cardiac medications. So what in general people need to know is if you have a history of heart disease, cardiomyopathy, what your current ejection fraction is, and if you have a history of abnormal heart rhythms. Um, especially for major surgery, um, we know that the heart in FA does not tolerate fluid shifts well, um, long periods of anesthesia and low blood pressure. This does not mean that you cannot get a major procedure or undergo anesthesia. What it means is that you need to have a collaborative approach and extra caution should be taken so that people can anticipate these and um, manage you appropriately uh, so that you can have a successful procedure. Again, clear communication with your team. And this is one of the instances where cardiac consultation is recommended prior so that you can obtain what we call cardiac clearance. So general recommendations for a healthy heart, Dr. Lynch um, said, talked about it, exercise is extremely important. Um, we say use it or lose it. So you need to continue to stay active so that um, uh, you can uh, you know, maintain that. Um, eating well, low sodium diet are also very important. If you are prescribed or recommended medications, um, there's not many um, times where we do in, in cardiac disease in FA. So if they're recommended, you know, and they're helping you continue to take them. Stay on top of your appointments, screening soon after diagnosis, surveillance every year, and then follow up with your providers for any heart symptoms. I'm not going to talk too much about research. This is a, you guys have all hopefully seen this impressive slide on the treatment pipeline on the FARA website. Um, specifically for cardiac disease, um, Dr. Payne um, from Indiana um, recently, just two months ago, put together a nice review on um, cardiac disease and research in FA. Um, we've had approximately 30 studies over the past 25 years, and um, there are many, many gaps in our knowledge um, about cardiac disease in FA, so we, we need a lot more studies to help improve that. We do have natural history studies specifically for cardiac disease in the work, and the new hot topic is gene therapy, not only targeting neurologic disease, but specifically heart disease. So in summary, um, the heart is important in FA because it's a common finding and it contributes to increased mortality. Um, early detection, surveillance, and follow-up is key. Reducing risk factors is important. We have many tools for evaluating the presence of heart disease, but our treatment is not specific for FA and is generalized from other forms of cardiomyopathy. Um, lastly, we need more work to, to be done to fill our knowledge gaps in research um, and working on a cure for FA and improving quality of life um, through uh, cardiac improvement. So thank you all. Again, here's my name, my email address. Be looking forward to taking questions during our panel. Mike, back on? Yeah, okay, thanks. So looking 
we probably should move on with Shana and then go to questions. So I'm going to introduce Shana, who doesn't need an introduction, so I won't give it to her. That's awesome. Well, Jen was kind enough to introduce me too, so I appreciate that, and I appreciate the, um, the previous two speakers. So while my slides are being loaded, um, from an endocrine perspective, my goal is to optimize the care of endocrine problems in folks with FA because the endocrine disorders that develop have established treatments. So to my mind, it is worth optimizing endocrine care so that folks can feel good, so that their heart and their nervous systems can function as well as possible. And our goal is to drill down within those endocrine disorders to say, what's the right management for folks with FA? How do they differ from the other forms of diabetes or osteoporosis for which we care. Awesome, so um, for folks who have heard me speak before, some of this will be review. Um, I've attempted to add some of our new research and I'm gonna wrap up um, in the interest of time just by highlighting a few studies related to endocrine and metabolic care um, that our research team can tell you more about if you're interested. Um, so my goal also in every time I give this talk is to make sure no one comes in sick with diabetes from FA, right? Because diabetes is treatable if caught early. Dave mentioned um, folks who missed screening during the pandemic who are coming in sick. We see that in our general endocrine practice too, and I really want to avoid it, right? So this is a, a schematic from our colleagues in the UK. Um, when diabetes develops and blood sugars get high, the high blood sugar spills into the urine, and so it produces an increase of amount of urine output. So folks pee and pee and pee, and as a result, they become dehydrated and they get thirsty. And you can imagine for folks who might have cardiac disease, that adds additional complications with respect to the risk for cardiac problems. So new excess thirst, peeing a lot, fatigue. Fatigue is complex and multifactorial, as Dave um, and Dr. Patel just mentioned, but a change in fatigue could indicate development of diabetes. Um, unintentional weight loss can also be a sign of losing calories um, from sugar through the urine. So getting tested is important. Um, I'm going to actually go over the testing, a little preview of what our consensus group mentioned for the care guidelines in just a minute. Um, Dave mentioned how we think about the categorization of diabetes related to FA. And I really um, think it's important to label conditions in a way that helps our specialists think about the problem, right? Like once we've given a label, this is type one, this is type two, diabetes, then people say, oh yeah, and then they kind of stop thinking. Um, so I'll, I'm hoping I'm gonna persuade you, Friedrich's related diabetes is share some features with what we think of as typical type one or type two, but is different. So um, our other endocrine colleagues who manage patients with FA-related diabetes, we say, oh, it's a little different. So like, keep thinking about this because you, you can't entirely use the same strategies you might in your other patients. So um, with respect to type one diabetes, type one diabetes is autoimmune mediated, meaning the immune system attacks the pancreas and so the pancreas, which is the, the organ that makes the hormone insulin that controls blood sugar, doesn't work well anymore. Um, typically, individuals with Friedrichs-related diabetes, be they children or adults, do not have evidence of the immune system acting against the pancreas. So in that way, Friedrichs-related diabetes, when it presents in children, is different than what we call typical or garden variety type one. The reason people say your child may have type 1 diabetes is because a lot of folks think of type 1 versus type 2 is, do you need insulin or not? Do you need shots of insulin every day? So children with FA-related diabetes often do need insulin. However, there's not the same autoimmunity that there is in quote-unquote garden variety type 1. And to my mind, it affects two things. It affects how quickly the diabetes develops. It also may affect whether or not there's a role for additional treatments beyond insulin, which I think we should continue to bear in mind. Similarly, adults with Friedrichs-related diabetes often are told they have type 2 diabetes, where there's a contribution from lifestyle factors, excess weight gain, inactivity. And while those factors are certainly important in the development of diabetes, problems with the pancreas producing insulin are present in individuals with adult onset Friedrichs-related diabetes also, and adults often progress to needing insulin 
more often than we might expect in quote unquote garden variety type two diabetes. So when I get a call from a consulting endocrinologist, I always make sure to emphasize it's a little different. So um, make sure you evaluate that in kind. Um, uh, we've looked, again, uh, kudos to the folks participating in FACOMS. We wouldn't have developed these insights without your participation. Um, one of the most recent assessments, folks um, in FACOMS around 9% um, had Friedrichs-related diabetes. Overall, the diabetes was pretty well controlled. Risk factors that Dave mentioned, more severe disease, more clinically severe disease, older age, um, higher body mass index, probably reflecting excess weight. Um, with respect to management, many folks with Friedrichs-related diabetes are not being offered some of the newer agents that we have to manage diabetes, and I think um, that's wrong. Even though we don't have a lot of data yet in Friedrichs, there are reasons to suspect that some of these medications may be helpful. They also may require some specific monitoring related to FA. Um, our Dr. Patel talked about how important it is for people managing medications to bear the other problems, health problems that folks with FA may have in mind. Um, so I think it's really important um, that folks be offered all of the range of therapeutic options that we have in our arsenal for diabetes with their Friedrichs in mind. I also have found that a lot of folks, um, perhaps because of their complexity, aren't offered the technology that we have available, which to my mind is also an oversight. We have things like continuous glucose monitors, insulin pumps, automated insulin delivery systems, all of which may have a role in Friedrichs-related diabetes. Um, so I'm not gonna go through all of the guidelines for intensification, I'm, I'm putting them up um, to highlight that there's so many different options to treat diabetes these days that I'm grateful for and that we're, our team is looking to understand the, the most important ones in Friedrichs. Um, questions I often get, like who needs insulin, right? So anyone who's shown up with a condition called diabetic ketoacidosis, and that's where there's an imbalance of acid in the blood related to insulin deficiency, those folks, at least out of the gate, need insulin. When blood sugars are high enough to cause dehydration, that can be dangerous and also acutely insulin can be helpful. And most often children have enough insulin deficiency in the pancreas that they need insulin too. Newer agents that I think deserve consideration in folks with, um, with diabetes who may meet criteria, two classes of medicines, glucagon receptor protein uh, type one, it's a mouthful, but they're medicines that end in glutide, semaglutide, liraglutide, dulaglutide, exenatide, there's, there's drugs like that deserve consideration, especially in folks who may be overweight. Um, SGLT2 inhibitors, those are medicines that end in glyphosin, dapaglyphosin, canaglyphosin, empaglyphosin. There's a really interesting relationship between those medicines and cardiac function that in certain patients those medicines may be additionally helpful. So consider asking about that if you're, um, if you're someone receiving diabetes treatment. Um, we always say for folks with diabetes to be mindful of avoiding excessively low blood sugars and very high levels of ketones. Um, Dave May in research uh, settings talk about the role of ketone metabolism in this condition, really interesting. Um, we know though that very, very high levels of ketones from insulin deficiency can make people sick um, and using technology is important. Um, so what do our guidelines say about diabetes? So Dr. Patel talked about the importance of screening. Hemoglobin A1C, and I was so pleased to see in the glossary it's been defined. Hemoglobin A1C is a blood test that measures what blood sugars have been over the last three months on average. So it can tell us if blood sugars have been running pretty high or running in a typical range. A1C may not be 100% sensitive for Friedrich's diabetes. In other words, we've seen folks who've had normal hemoglobin A1Cs but whose blood sugars have been creeping up. That said, if the choice is between no screening at all and a hemoglobin A1C, we'd rather they, <laughs> they get the A1C, right? Because we know that if it's elevated, it's something that deserves follow-up. The fasting blood sugar adds to our ability to detect abnormal blood sugars early and initiate that effective treatment. We may recommend a test called a glucose tolerance test that our research participants may be familiar with that we use in clinical practice um, to consider for prediabetes. 
Um, we're also investigating, Jacqueline Tamra from our group, the use of continuous glucose monitoring as the diagnostic test. So we can put a little device on the upper arm that measures blood sugar continuously for two weeks. And we think that that may be an alternative to the traditional glucose tolerance test that most folks don't love to evaluate blood sugar patterns and identify a need for treatment early. Um, so growth and weight gain, we've heard a little bit in the preceding talks about how important those are. One insight from a recent FACOMS paper, a lot of folks are mis missing measurements, and that's on us as healthcare providers, right? Like in the endocrine clinic, we need to make sure we have wheelchair scale so folks can get a weight um, even if they may not be able to stand independently for one. Measuring height or length um, in children who are growing or using alternative measurements, measuring the ulna, the tibia, those are different bones, can really be helpful in pediatric assessments, and they're really simple tools, but they don't often get done. Um, the reason that's important is that growth affects a lot of the different um, problems that folks with FA can develop. So um, on the right side of the slide, you'll see growth pattern. So the x-axis is age. Um, and the y-axis is how fast kids are growing. So you'll see around 11 for girls and around 13 to for 14 for boys is when the pubertal growth spurt occurs, right? And the reason that's important, there's a few. So um, folks talked about scoliosis earlier. So kids without FA who have scoliosis, and the same is true for folk, kids with FA, the, the increase, the rapid increase in growth can be associated with the worsening of scoliosis. Also, in, in typical healthy kids and kids with FA, the um, appendicular skeleton, so the arms and legs, grow before the axial skeleton, before the spine, and they grow before the muscles grow and before the bones get stronger. So that's a unique time when kids look gangly for a reason, they're more likely to fall, and where the muscle and bone strength may not have caught up. So it's a unique time to be vulnerable to broken bones. Um, we found in our study that children may be underweight by body mass index. Um, I'll mention the body mass index, which is what we use kind of in clinical practice as an approximation of body composition, in other words, as nutritional status, doesn't tend to work very well in kids with chronic conditions where muscle mass may be less. And I'll show you um, a little bit about that on the next slide. That said, having some information to reflect nutritional status is better than none. We just have to, as clinicians, interpret it in context. Um, adults may develop increasing body mass index with age that may be related to nutrition or activity and worth paying attention to because of associated diabetes risk also. Um, so I'm, in the interest of time, I won't go through this in detail, but this, um, the, bod the figures, the graphics on the left and right, uh, essentially show that for similar body mass index, which is the tool we use most often in clinic, to evaluate someone's weight relative to their height, um, individuals with Friedrichs may have much less muscle mass than we expect. That may be developmental, that may be related to their activity, but when we make assumptions based on body mass index, we may overlook that important fact clinically. Um, so what do our guidelines say about growth and nutrition? First, we point out for clinicians some of the limitations of BMI and bearing these in mind, we still remember we, the recommend assessing the anthropometrics, the weight and the height at annual visits um, so that we can give guidance on the process of growth and, and nutrition. Um, bone health is another really important um, component of, of health care, and I think one that's often easily overlooked. I think a, a symposium a few years ago um, we were told about a young person with a fragility fracture. So a fragility fracture is a broken bone from a, a mechanism you wouldn't expect, right? So if someone has a car accident and they break their femur, they break their thigh bone, we're not necessarily surprised about that. But from some for someone who falls from standing and breaks that same bone, we consider that a fragility fracture, a sign that the bone is fragile. And from some of the studies we've done, we know that folks with FA may have more fragile bones. And so we want to do everything we can to detect that problem, treat it if it's present, and prevent it to the extent we can. Um, by way of vocabulary, when we measure bone health with a DEXA scan, with a scan that uses ionizing radiation to measure density, older adults will get a T-score, kids will get a Z-score. So from statistics, you'll, we can go over the details for folks who are interested, but in adults, we compare an adult 
to where they were at their prime. So bone health peaks around their 30s. In kids, we measure bone health to where it should be, we think developmentally, since bone density is something that increases over time. So if the T-score or the Z-score is very low, less than around minus 2.5, that can be an additional sign of fragile bones that deserves um, follow-up. Um, this is a picture of the DEXA scanning table of all the tests um, that folks undergo, probably one of the most um, straightforward ones. You lie on the table for 10 to 15 minutes and that kind of goes across. Um, DEXA scans give us some information about how fragile the bones are, but don't entirely capture the risk of fracture. Um, we've, and we'll, we'll get to this um, in a second, but I'll just mention now, we recommend DEXA scanning for sure in anyone who's had a fragility fracture, meaning anyone who's had a broken bone where we think, gosh, that seems surprising that someone would break their bone for that reason. Um, we also think given the availability of medicines to treat um, low bone density, there's a lot in adults, more than there were even a year ago, um, that we should have a low threshold to screen, especially in folks who've been using wheelchairs for a few years where we think their bones may be more fragile. So balance, strength, and fall prevention are key. Um, exercise and physical therapy should be bone safe. So there are may means of doing exercise and doing physical therapy that can protect for a fragile bones and um, practitioners should use those. Um, Dave talked about vitamin D and calcium. Um, I'm often asked like, what's a reasonable starting place? 800 units of D3 in kids and 1,000 in adults is often enough to overcome the deficiency that most of us have. So even folks without FA, um, in order to help make sure vitamin D helps us absorb calcium and make sure the calcium stays in our bones. That's a reasonable starting place. Um, your practitioner may choose to measure levels to help make sure that those doses keep them in a good range. I mentioned the availability of medications, um, and those are really underutilized in the general population and in folks with chronic health conditions. Um, so there may be a role for a bone specialist to help with that. Um, the schematic on the right shows data um, that was published recently from folks, from adults with Friedrich's ataxia, um, and we also have similar data in kids. Um, the blue bars show the bone density scores that are lower, right? So like our clinical experience kind of aligns with some of the data we've been getting in the research setting. Um, so I mentioned DEXA scans are for adults at risk and children at high, highest risk and re-articulating some of those um, calcium and vitamin D. Calcium, we say three to four servings a day of a calcium-containing food ought to be plenty, um, and then vitamin D supplementation is something uh, that's reasonable. So takeaway points this is, um, from the ride from a few years ago. I get to update this based on yesterday. Um, remembering the symptoms of FA-related diabetes, getting screened regularly is helpful, and making sure to consider the full range of treatment um, available. Following growth and rate gain is important, and remembering the limitations of BMI when interpreting what those measurements show us. Attending to bone health, especially in, in individuals who may fracture, and thinking ahead of how calcium and vitamin D can help keep the bones as strong as possible. Um, in the interest of time, I may just like click through each of the slides of our studies that are recruiting that are related to endocrinology and metabolism. Um, and again, we think and we hope that optimizing endocrine and metabolic care keeps the whole person healthy and keeps the nervous system and heart healthy too. So um, exercise has come up in the past couple of talks and clinically we have this sense of how important it is. Dave mentioned mitochondrial health, mood. We would add Dr. Patel you know, mentioned cardiac health, endocrine health, diabetes, you know, blood sugar management is easier. Um, bones are stronger with exercise, but it's not been rigorously tested in Friedrich. So we have a clinical trial that's supported by the NIH, National Institutes of Health, that tests not only exercise, but also a supplement, a precursor of a metabolite called nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide that's important for energy metabolism. Um, so it's a three-month study that includes exercise treatment for some folks, for folks not randomized to receive the exercise, they have the ability to do that at the end. So it's available to, um, the exercise is available to all eligible participants. So that's one of the studies um, that we're recruiting for. You see the picture of Kyle, like top and center there, because he um, helped advise us and continues to advise us on how we're doing. Um, I, this is a, a prompt to 
for me to thank this community explicitly. We're past our halfway goal in our recruitment because we've had such um, terrific response. So we're so appreciative of everyone who has participated. I think we're going to learn a lot about the role of exercise and the role of NAD metabolism in Fregix as, as a result. So thank you. Thank you also so much for that. Um, Anna, who is the lead coordinator, is sitting right over. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, Anna is sitting right over there, um, and along with Julian and Kayla, who can talk about our studies. Um, also about to recruit with Ferris support, we uh, collaborate with radiology colleagues who have new ways of measuring NAD in muscle and brain. Um, and we're interested in, you, in testing these assessments so we know more about the role of manipulating NAD in FA as a possible component of treatment. Um, and Jacqueline Tamroff, who got support initially from Friedrichs for her training, is the one who's specifically looking at continuous glucose monitoring, the role for that in FA, and how the glucose trends are related to what's going on in the heart. Um, so that's an entirely remote study. It, as for anyone who's been seen at CHOP and has had an echo, um, Jacqueline can send on a continuous glucose monitor. Also, anyone who's in the, um, maybe colleagues who are watching online who's in the vicinity of Vanderbilt, she also has a phenotyping study going on there to look at metabolism. All right, Jen, I know I'm a few minutes past, but thanks for letting me um, share those slides about the studies. Okay, okay, we'll try and take two questions. Uh, anyone for Shane or Arthi in particular? Anyone? And back at, can't see. If uh, someone's looking for a cardiologist or an endocrinologist, should they search out someone who has a knowledge or a specialty in Friedrich's, Friedrich's ataxia? I mean, is, is Arthi still with us? or she? Are you still there, Dr. Patel? I am. I'm Good. here. Your thoughts on that one? Did you hear the question? Uh, I did. So, you know, I think it. there are a few centers that have um, cardiologists who are experienced in FA. And so I think that the initial evaluation, and it's always good to have somebody at your local area who can manage day-to-day -day things that might come up. Um, Often what I do here at um, University of South Florida is when people come for their, neuro, for their neurology visit um, at the ataxia center, we will also pair that with a cardiology visit. So those annual surveillance um, uh, visits can occur intermittently, but I do think it's important for someone to have somebody locally um, in case things come up. And with the new clinical management guidelines coming out, I think that the important thing is having resources um, for the providers locally um, and uh, um, myself, and I'm sure all the other cardiology providers and endocrine providers in FA, we remain a, a resource and available for, for any pract practitioner that wants to care for patients with FA. Great. One more question from someone. Uh, yes, Gretchen. With diabetes, it I don't know if this is common, I'm, I'm curious about this. When our son um, initially showed symptoms of diabetes and, and when we had testing, we actually had testing like before we got to an, uh, an endocrinologist, like several within a couple, like, you know, a couple a week, another week and stuff. He, it seemed like he flipped really fast from being pre-diabetic to like, you know, like peeing a, a, a thought, you know, like just like filling up his urinal and all that stuff. Is that <laughs> common with FA or just diabetes in general? Yeah, thanks so much for that question. So the question is, is it common to go from like kind of percolating along with the prediabetes to then kind of falling over? That can happen. The reason for that is we only need about like 5 to 10% of our pancreas to be working well to maintain reasonable blood sugars. So it can be that once the blood sugars start to be high, then, and, and there's just like a percentage that drops, then you can kind of fall off. So the importance of the pancreas in this condition can mean that. Um, we also know there's resistance to insulin in folks with FA. So well before the blood sugars start to go up, we see that the pancreas is having to like work harder. So that can happen. So it's great that the reason the guidelines will mention that anyone who's in that pre-diabetes range deserves 
potentially an endocrine visit, but to be offered a blood sugar monitor, other tools to help make sure that if things start to get worse that they can be attended to directly. And sometimes we even start medicines in, when folks are not quite at that threshold to see if we can um, prevent that fall off. Because it seems like the first test he was like in the low 200s and then like a week or week and a half later he was like like almost 400. I mean it was just you know before we got in to see the endocrinologist and and it was just so fast. Yeah well I'm glad he got into endocrine but um, just as Dr. Patel mentioned like if folks are having those marginal tests and need guidance about like how fast does this person need to go in like those 200s um, should certainly prompt quick attention. And then just kind of a comment, thank you for explaining um, how A1C can be low and their sugars can be high, because there were several visits that we did where we were like, I swear his A1C is going to be high because he is like falling off the wagon, and then they'd be like, oh, it's 7.2, and it's like, that just doesn't make any sense. It, and for another time, but we think there's a few conditions where the A1C doesn't like match the blood sugars in the same way, and Friedrich seems to be one of them. Well, thank you to our first panel. Um, can I ask our next panel to come up? So we have um, many different speakers for the next panel. We want to provide updates on all of the clinical trials that are currently ongoing. Um, so we have like four or five panelists, if you would come up now. Um, while folks are coming up and getting started, I'm just going to give um, a quick overview so um, for our panelists, um, we're going to have um, Dr. Kim from Design uh, speak first, and then uh, Dr. Yao from PTC, and then Ms. Shaw from Riata, and then Dr. Kelly from Stealth, and then Dr. Barth from Lexio, just so you know what order you're all going in. <laughs> but please, come on up. Um, also, just to get us started, this is, um, I think everybody knows what our treatment pipeline is, um, but this is just a picture of all of the different drugs that are currently in development. And I thought it would be really fun to just quickly go through what's happened from a year ago to today. So if you were here with us a year ago, how has this treatment pipeline changed? Well, first of all, if I go from the top to the bottom, um, omeveloxalone has moved into being reviewed by the FDA. So this is the first drug that we currently have under review for approval uh, with the FDA, and you're going to hear a little more about that today. Yeah. <laughs> the PTC MOVE studies fully enrolled everybody's in, kind of cranking through all the visits, taking all the pills, and um, we're now starting to have folks finish the double blind and go into the open label extension. And we've also opened an additional study for young children under the age of seven. Yeah. Dr. McCormick just mentioned she got through that 50% enrollment on the NAD and exercise study, and um, we still need 36 more people to sign up for the study, and her study coordinators are here, so please take advantage of this opportunity. I also learned yesterday that somebody who just completed the study had his exercise bike and was able to do ride ataxia. Last visit and first ride ataxia, that's pretty awesome. Um, Dr. McCormick also finished a study uh, looking at another form of NAD in a small number of people with FA to look to see if we can see changes um, in the heart, and so that completed this year. Dr. Lynch started the Elvis study, which is um, a drug called elamipratide that you're going to learn a little bit more about from, um, from Stealth Therapeutics, but that study fully enrolled in like record time, I think it was about three months, um, the study was fully enrolled and it's, so it's ongoing now with visits and we hope that'll complete um, early next year. 
We do have some attrition in our treatment pipeline. We know that not everything's going to work. Um, so we learned the results of the retrotope study and that that drug did not um, improve symptoms in FA. We um, had some exciting news in the last few weeks that the Laramar drug CTI-1601, which is a frataxin protein replacement, has come off clinical hold with the FDA and is now going into a phase two study. We had a webinar on that on Thursday night and um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in, at the end if we have time, but if not, the webinar will be released on Monday, so if you missed it, you can, you'll be able to watch that. There's a study in Italy ongoing of atravarine um, with um, Fratagene and Dr. Martuzzi, Martinuzzi. They've completed enrollment for that study. The final visits are completing, and they hope to have um, results around the end of the year. Design Therapeutics started a phase one study um, of a new drug in FA called uh, a gene TAC, and you're gonna learn more about that. But that phase one study started and is almost halfway complete. Um, so a lot of, lot of progress in a short, short period of time this past year for the, a brand new drug in our pipeline. In Australia, our colleagues are looking at resveratrol in FA, and they completed um, a phase two study in the past year, and we're expecting to hear some results, hopefully at the international conference in November. Um, we had attrition of another therapeutic approach. It was an oligonucleotide approach being developed by Exacure Therapeutics. And then another major milestone is that we had our first gene therapy move from the the lab bench uh, to the clinic, and an IND was approved for gene therapy that Lexio Therapeutics and Dr. Crystal at Weill Cornell have been developing. And so there are now two phase one studies open for the first gene therapy in FA to look at um, treating the heart. Yeah. So you're going to hear about many of these um, by our panelists, and hopefully we'll have time at the end for questions for all of them. I think I'm going to ask all of the panelists to give their presentations, and then we'll open it for questions at the end. Um, but just to know, when you add up all the participants in all these studies, that's more than 450 people in our FA community participating in clinical trials in the past year worldwide. And that's a huge accomplishment, and have to thank all of you for that. All right, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kim from Design Therapeutics. Thank you, Jen. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> so I apologize if I move a little bit stiffly. I'm a little sore from yesterday's ride taxi. <laughs> Kyle, you're amazing. <laughs> So uh, my name is Jay Kim, I'm Chief Medical Officer of Design Therapeutics, and it is a privilege to have, uh, you know, uh, to be able to present to you today, and thank you, Farah, for the invitation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I have uh, some forward-looking statements in today's presentation. Thank you. As, while that's updating, I can just continue speaking. Uh, as a, as David Lynch uh, eloquently stated earlier today, the root cause of Friedrich's ataxia stems from the inability of cells in the body to express a gene called frataxin. And we have found that we can measure frataxin in cells from the blood. And on the right, you see that cells from Friedrich's ataxia patients have low expression of frataxin. And in healthy individuals, that level of frataxin is normal. What we have also found is that treatment of cells derived from Friedrich's ataxia patients can increase in frataxin to normal levels in a dose-dependent fashion with gene tac therapeutics, with gene tac small molecules. Conversely, treatment with gene tac small molecules in healthy individuals results in no change, and it did not alter frataxin expression. That is because gene tac small molecules work under the control of the endogenous or native regulatory controls in gene expression. So here we describe a little bit about the mechanism of action of 
uh, of the Friedrix ataxia gene tax molecules. <coughs> and gene tax small molecules are hetero bifunctional small molecules that target gene mutations in a sequence spe specific manner. And in the case of the therapeutic for Friedrich ataxia, the investigational therapeutic, this small molecule targets the, GA, the pathologic GAA expansion repeats. And on the right-hand panel, you see in the upper portion that in the disease state of Friedrich's ataxia, RNA polymerase, the protein that transcribes the gene into the code of life, from the code of life to the RNA, stalls on these GAA expansion repeats and there, thereby uh, producing a state of ineffective gene transcription. And in the bottom, you see that in the presence of gene tax small molecules, that the small molecule can facilitate the elongation of the frataxin gene expression such that a, uh, an intact RNA from for, for, for frataxin can be uh, expressed and, uh, and also via the endogenous control of the, uh, the, the normal regulatory elements of frataxin. So design's therapeutic approach is to increase endogenous frataxin levels and restore normal cellular function. And as a small molecule therapeutic, uh, we expect to be able to distribute uh, across the body such that we can address the protein manifestations of, of Friedrich's ataxia across the body. So here we summarize our current phase one program, which is composed of a single and multiple stu dose studies of IV administ intravenously administered DT216 of our Friedrich's ataxia gene tac small molecule therapeutic in FA patients. The primary and secondary objectives are first and foremost safety and tolerability and also the pharmacokinetics of DT216 in Friedrich's ataxia patients. The exploratory study objective is to evaluate uh, the proof of mechanism of DT216, and that is to, uh, is, that is to demonstrate increase in frataxin expression in Friedrich's ataxia patients. As you can see on the left portion of the slide, the patient population uh, being recruited for our phase one program are representative of the wide range of symptomatology in Friedrich's ataxia patients. And we require, however, genetic confirmation of FA with homozygous GA expansion repeats and uh, less than or equal to uh, stage 5.5 on the functional staging of uh, ataxia scale. We are really encouraged and excited to share that the single ascending dose first in human study is uh, dose escalating as planned, as Jen had, had uh, shared with you earlier. And also we're excited to say that we are, have just started actively recruiting for a multiple ascending dose study. Now, uh, on the left-hand bottom part, you see the uh, clinicaltrials.gov identifier. We're fi filing uh, for one for the multiple dose uh, study very shortly. Uh, and if you are wondering whether or not you want to participate in the single or multiple dose studies, do not worry. Uh, you, you would be equally eligible at the end, end of the study to participate in a future open label extension study. So you could take it and cut in both angles. Boy, do I uh, want to get the most out of this investigational therapeutic by getting multiple doses, or do you want to get the quick way out, get a single dose, and qualify for the open label extension? You can have it either way. <laughs> so um, it, is, uh, it remains such a privilege to serve this uh, amazing uh, patient community and uh, happy to answer questions at the end of the session. Thank you. Good morning again. And uh, I'm Bert Yao, and I oversee clinical programs for FA at the PTC Therapeutics. And PTC is a company and, uh, with 25 years of history. 
and it's dedicated to developing therapies for orphan diseases, and particularly neuromuscular diseases, uh, including FA. So as you can see on the screen, so we have two programs. So one is a small molecule, uh, vertigonin. Uh, another one is a gene therapy. So which truly reflect our uh, dedication and commitment uh, to FA. So we have been working on vertigonin for decades uh, with your help, your support, and finally, we will be able to reach uh, the finish line in the near future with our ongoing phase three clinical trial in FA. Uh, on behalf of PTC, I'd uh, like to thank you all, all patients, families, and fellow, and our clinician in the FA community, again, for your support, uh, your dedication, your commitment as well. So for the rest of the time, I'd like to uh, provide an update on our uh, clinical uh, program, basically the phase three program. And now I'd like to briefly explain how vertigonin works in terms of as a potential treatment for FA. So vertigonin is a potent inhibitor of an enzyme called 15 lipoxinase. So this enzyme plays a critical role in a programmed cell death called peripatosis. So research work, including our research uh, with vertigonin, has demonstrated that the inhibition of the enzyme prevents peripatosis. So that means that the vertigonin may have potential to preserve the cells, and particularly those cells which are rich uh, mitochondrial cells, basically, in FA. And uh, about six years ago, we did a, a clinical trial, a physical clinical trial in FA patients. This is one of the key results from the study. As you can see, the patients treated with vertigonin had significant improvement in FARS scores from baseline. And there were about six point difference in FAR scores uh, between vertigonin treated group and also the matching subject from the nat uh, natural history database. So the p-value was less than 0 0.001, uh, which means the difference in FARS between this group was statistically very significant. It is worth to mention and vertigonin has been studied in more than 600 subjects, a mostly pediatric population, uh, in multiple indications. And vertigonin has been showing uh, safe and well tolerated so far. So this slide really uh, gives you an overview of the ongoing phase three clinical trial design. So I just maybe make a couple of highlights. So one is about the age range. So you can see here, the age range is really wide and uh, including as young as seven years old. Another one I'd like to make is about the length of the placebo controlled phase of the study, the phase three study. It is uh, 72 weeks and basically one and a half years, pretty long, which allows us to fully evaluate the effect of vertigonin in the population. In addition, and all subjects who complete the, the ongoing phase three clinical trial, we have the option to participate in a long-term open-label study, so where everyone will receive vertigonin for a long period of time. Now finally, I'd like to provide an update on where we are with the phase three clinical trial and what the next milestones are. So the trial was, uh, enrollment of the trial was completed late last year and a total of 146 subjects were enrolled in 14 centers across nine countries. And most patients are younger than 18 years old. So we anticipate to have top line data in the second quarter next year. So I have to say that it has been tremendous 
effort from all patients, families, and clinicians at the center and trial staff and the follower and uh, to get the study up and running and to successfully achieve the, uh, the completion of the enrollment. And the study is ongoing, uh, is going smoothly. I want to thank you all for your continued support and we certainly will provide more updates in the near future and we are looking forward to provide more updates actually uh, in the near future as well. And that's probably all I have today. Thank you again. Good morning, how's everyone doing? Feeling good? All right. Well, my name is Pyle Shaw. I am the Associate Director of Patient Advocacy at Riata Pharmaceuticals. Um, between yesterday and today, it's been a pleasure uh, getting to know some of you, and I hope throughout the day today, I'll have an opportunity to at least introduce myself and say hello to the remainder of you. Uh, for the sake of time, this presentation is going to be very brief in nature, um, but please come find me after the fact, and I'm happy to answer any questions, and of course, at the end of this session, we'll have some Q&A. So let's just jump right into it. Of course, I have to give you a disclaimer. The presentation of clinical trial data is for informational purposes only and is not intended to promote any Riata Pharmaceuticals product or program. Omaviloxolone is an investigational drug and its safety and eff efficacy have not been established by any agency, including the US Food and Drug Administration. So I hope you can see this slide okay. And the goal of this slide is really twofold. Um, I really want to present to you what it takes to get any clinical trial uh, up to speed and up to where Riata is today. And so let me just put a baseline down. MOXIE is the name of our clinical trial, and omaviloxolone is the name of the molecule. MOXIE has three parts. Part one was the dose ranging study. So the goal of this study was to determine the optimal dose, the Effic most efficacious dose that's gonna work in our clinical studies moving forward. Part two, which I'll touch on here, is our safety and efficacy study. And then part three is the open label extension study, which is currently ongoing. For those patients that completed part one and part two, they are eligible to be in the part three open, lab open label extension study. So, I'll have your attention in the, in the very first half of that timeline where it says fourth quarter of 2019, MOXIE part two delivered the top line results. You'll see in the third quarter of 2020, the FDA responded to Riata saying, unfortunately, your part two data is not, uh, is not sufficient enough to submit a new drug application. What I want to point out is in the first quarter of 2021, the FA community, so patients like you, uh, advocacy groups like FARA, healthcare providers, uh, investigators, all of you came together to write a FA community response letter, which included over 74,000 signatures on this petition. That is no small feat. And the, yes. And that letter went to regulators at the FDA, went to RIATA leadership. And the reason why I bring this up is because your patient voice is so incredibly important. Amongst other things, that letter helped support another sit-down meeting with the FDA. And FDA then suggested to RIATA, why don't we revisit the MOXIE and OMAV clinical program? So, Kudos to you, and I highly encourage that continued patient voice participation because it does make a difference. So move, let's move forward. Riata was able to submit a new drug application in May of uh, this year, actually last year, I apologize, and we were given a original PADUFA date. So a PADUFA date is essentially the end of a review cycle. So the FDA, FDA says, once we've been able to adequately review all the data and material, we can give you a date which says, okay, we've completed our review. Originally, that was November 30th of this year. 
Now, between the time an original application, uh, new drug application was submitted and to the PDUFA date, a number of meetings have to occur. And in one of those meetings, the FDA said to Riata, we would appreciate and we would allow some more supporting data to be submitted. Now, and I'll get into this in further slides, uh, the supporting data that was submitted on behalf of Riata did constitute a major NDA change, a major amendment. And therefore, the FDA said, hey, we need some more time to review that material, hence why, as you may be well aware, the FDA announced a PDUFA extension of February 2023. So that's our key dates there. So we now have a PDUFA date of February 2023, as I mentioned, and if approved, we are anticipating a U.S. launch in the first half of next year. So very quickly, I'm going to review the part two pivotal trial of omavaloxone in FA. This was an international, double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized registrational trial. It enrolled a wide and represent, re representative range of patients with genetic, genetically confirmed FA. We included a baseline MFAR score of between 20 to 80. And remember, if the lower you are on the MFAR score, the better off you are faring. And we enrolled uh, patient ages of 16 to 40. Patients were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to receive OMAV-150 OMAV or placebo for 48 weeks. And in our all randomized population, we had 103 patients. In the full analysis set, we excluded patients with Pescavis, and that total came out to 82. The primary endpoint was the change from baseline and MFAR score at week 48 in the full analysis set. And what I'll draw your attention to is if you look at the study design, you'll see that uh, both placebo and OMAV groups were treated for 48 weeks, and then there was a four-week drug withdrawal period, so a four-week drug washout period. And then at week 52, if a patient was interested, eligible, and uh, wanted to move on to the open label extension, they could most certainly do so. Regarding the results, MOXIE met the primary endpoint of change from baseline in MFAR score at week 48 in the full analysis set. So if you look at the graph on the left-hand side, you'll see the study week on the x-axis, which is zero, zero to 48 weeks, and on the y-axis, you'll see the change from baseline in MFAR score. And right in the middle there, you'll see point, the zero point line through the middle of the graph. OMAV treatment, which is an N of 40, was shown in the blue line, and placebo is shown in the gray line. Now remember, the lower you go, the better you're faring. So the MFAR score showed improvement as compared to placebo in the OMAV treated group. And that between group difference was approximately two points. Uh, as you may know, MFARS has a number of components within the MFARS, including bulbar tests, upper limb stability, lower limb stability, um, and upright stability. And within those components, OMAV also showed improvement relative to placebo. Regarding the safety, adverse events were generally mild to moderate in intensity. Uh, you can see most adverse events were reported in the first 12 weeks of treatment. You can see in the table there, the most common uh, adverse events were contusions, which are bruises, and headache. If you go down the list, you'll also see what's important to note is ALT and AST increases. AST and ALT are measures to determine liver health. And so when those are elevated along with other markers, that is some sign that there might be some indication of liver injury. However, in this case, while those numbers uh, in the OMAF treated group were elevated, they did return back to baseline after, with continued treatment of omavaloxone, and they were not associated with any other indicators of liver injury. So if you'll remember, uh, I mentioned that the FDA responded to Riata saying, we would love to see some supporting data, uh, hence the reason why the PDUFA date got extended out to February. And if you look on the right-hand side under what says additional data, 
those are the three main topics and data that was submitted to the FDA most recently. The delayed start analysis. So that essentially takes, if you'll remember, in the part two data, we had patients treated with either placebo or OMAP. What the delayed start analysis does is that it takes the folks that were treated with placebo, moves them over to treatment, and then we want to determine is if those patients started later than those that were originally treated with OMAV in part two, how do they fare? What difference, what difference in MFAR score does that look like? So that's what de delayed start analysis is. The propensity matched analysis is we're going to take everyone from our part two analysis and we're going to match them with age, gender, and many other factors. We're going to match them to the natural history study, which is uh, FACOMS or FACOMS, um, which many of you are aware of. And we're going to match them to a patient in the natural history study and determine uh, does MFAR, how does MFARS progress when you compare the two groups. And then thirdly, uh, of course, we need more information. The FDA wanted more information to support OMAV's mechanism of action. Uh, looking at safety, there have been no new safety findings in the ongoing open label extension study, so that's key to note here. And that's all I have for now. Good morning. I'm Gene Kelly from Stealth Biotherapeutics. Thanks for including me in your program today. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Stealth and Elamipatide. So Stealth is a small um, biotech company based outside of Boston. By small, I mean there's less than 50 people in the company currently. Uh, we have a lead compound called Elamipatide, which we've looked at in a number of different uh, diseases, uh, mostly focusing on the effects of mitochondrial function. I lost my monitor. Uh-huh. All right. <laughs> Absolutely. So it is, you know, it is a small company, and we've been looking at a number of different clinical trials. Can we look? Oh, right. Perfect. So primarily in rare diseases, but also in some diseases of aging. Um, we've looked at things like Labor's hereditary optic neuropathy, which affect vision, will cause blindness in young men. We've looked at things like Barth syndrome which has a cardiomyopathy component of it. Um, the compound has been used in about 1,400 patients, and the longest on treatment is about four years. If you look at this, it's kind of a busy chart, but the, the most important point is that uh, our Barth syndrome program is the furthest along. We're in active conversations with the FDA. Uh, as my colleague alluded to earlier, uh, the importance of patient advocacy groups, the Barth Syndrome Foundation has been critical in order to get things moving with our conversations with the FDA. Uh, but if you, if you look, what, what I want to point out is that if in Barth syndrome and Duchenne, we're looking at those, comp those particular diseases uh, because there is a cardiomyopathy component, and we believe that the mitochondria plays a role in that. We're also looking at mitochondrial myopathy, where there's clearly a mitochondrial component. Uh, and also, we've looked in things like dry AMD, geographic atrophy, and we've been able to show in each of these diseases, engagement of the mitochondria and improvements uh, in, in, in clinical benefits. So we continue to pursue. We have some pipeline compounds as well that we'll be focusing more on neurodegenerative diseases. Just to tell you a little bit about the compound, this compound targets mitochondria. And mitochondria is in every cell in the body. Most of you probably remember from school the powerhouse of the cell. So basically, that's where energy is made. And there's a, a tight link between structure and function. Cardiolipin plays a key role in creating the structure of the mitochondria. And this compound helps tether the mitochondrial structure back together and shows improvements in bioenergetics. It also shows a decrease in reactive oxygen species. And a combination of impaired energetics and oxidative stress have, are thought to play a role in the etiology of Friedrich's ataxia. So there's currently a trial going on at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Uh, it's being sponsored by uh, Dr. David Lynch, 
and we're, we're supporting it in collaboration with the Friedrichs Ataxia Research Alliance. So thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Jay Barth, the Chief Medical Officer at Lexio Therapeutics, and I really appreciate the invitation from Farah to come and share with you uh, where we stand right now in this program. And it has been great to see the pipeline slide that Jen showed in the other presentations and how we hope to bring from a, a different mechanism through gene therapy another way to potentially treat the cardiomyopathy associated with FA. Okay, uh, just tell about Lexio, and I had the pleasure of being here a year ago, which I think was the first time that Lexio appeared. We're a new company. Uh, it's a biotech company that was formed a couple of years ago out of the work that Dr. Ron Crystal, who is really one of the leaders, pioneers in the field of gene therapy, and uh, he founded the company called Lexio, and we continue a very close collaboration with Weill Cornell in New York. We also have a collaboration with UC San Diego, who have been leaders in the field of cardiac gene therapy. So bring together these two academic sources of the technology, of the medicines that we're working on, they all feed into our company, which is working in a few different areas, but leading our programs in the field of cardiac gene therapy is this uh, program for FA-associated cardiomyopathy. And I'll just mention now, because it's come up, and I'm speaking about the Lexio cardiac gene therapy study. There's also a Cornell cardiac gene therapy study, and this has been addressed in webinars before and also by far in other places. So I'm not representing that. I have to say the two studies are quite similar. There are some differences between the two, uh, some differences in inclusion criteria and which patients would qualify and a little differences in endpoint. But it's the same drug, the same gene therapy in both trials, since our company was founded out of Cornell. So I'll speak about our trial, but there is also, I should mention, the trial that Cornell is doing just at their site in New York City. The, the reason that Lexio had decided to pursue a gene therapy for cardiac disease within FA, and Dr. Patel explained this in a lot more detail uh, than shown here, but along the same lines, it was a recognition that with gene therapy, there was the opportunity to restore the frataxin, which is deficient, low levels in heart cells as well as cells of the central nervous system, all due to the same mechanism. And because the cardiomyopathy in one form or another affects most patients at some point along the way uh, of people who are living with FA, we felt that this is an important target to treat as it can compromise health status. And, uh, and of course, this is an unmet need. Although there are medications that treat the, some of the cardiac symptoms or some of the effects on the heart, none of them are specific to FA or really get to the underlying cause of the heart disease in FA. And we hope to do that. And that's our drug, uh, which is I'll explain, AVRH10F for tax and what that is, but the code uh, for it is LX2006, has the potential, and of course we know yeah, this is investigational and we're just starting the process of studying it to improve or stabilize the cardiac disease. And that's based on, and I won't go into it, extensive testing in animals uh, who have FA, as it were, who have the heart disease in FA and being able to show that with this gene therapy, at least in the, the mouse models that were studied, that the heart disease either was stabilized or improved. And we're able then to move that into the clinic. So what is the, the mechanism here? So LX206, first the mechanism of, of the heart disease in FA is due, as you've heard before, to deficiency of frataxin, the protein that is at very low levels, in the mitochondria in the cells of the heart. And because the mitochondria are not functioning uh, normally because of this, the cells of the heart, the cardiac myocytes, are not functioning normally, leading to decreases in the function of the heart, its pumping ability, its contracting ability, 
also causes arrhythmias and so on. The mechanism of this treatment is, and in gene therapy in general, the principles are that you take a vector, and that's shown in the uh, figure on the bottom, the AAVRH10. What does that mean? AAV is adeno-associated virus. It is a deactivated, harmless virus that does not cause disease. But what it does do, like all viruses do, is that it infects cells. It brings things into the cells. And here we want to take the AAVRH10, this vector, it's a carrier, and inside it is the frataxin gene. And then it, the virus brings it inside the cells of the heart. And what's in, inside the cells? These heart cells start producing frataxin, at least that is the principle. And the frataxin is in the mitochondria where it restores the function of the mitochondria that were not act, uh, functioning normally, and thereby improving the function of the heart cells where the mitochondria are located. So it sounds fairly straightforward in principle. Of course, there's a lot and a lot of science that goes behind it. And gene therapy, I should say more generally, has been something that has been around for years and years now. There are two gene therapy treatments that are approved by FDA for different diseases. One's a neurologic disease, one's a disease of vision. So the era of gene therapy has definitely arrived, and there are dozens or probably hundreds of gene therapy trials of different uh, gene therapies going on right now. So it's relatively new technology, but on the other hand, it has been around for quite some time, and people with various conditions have been treated with gene therapy, both neurologic conditions and other diseases of other organs of the body. Our study is uh, study LX20601, which is a typical, we call it phase one, two, because in the gene therapy space, as in many other areas, the first trial is performed in people who are living with the condition. And the design of this study is that there are two cohorts of patients, and it's done sequentially. First, there is a lower dose cohort of five patients in that. Next is cohort two, five patients in a higher dose. 52 weeks is the first period of follow-up of the uh, treatment, but then, as FDA requires for all gene therapies, there's another four years of follow-up. But that four years of follow-up, which then totals five years, in the subsequent four years, it's just basically less frequent visits. It's really the first year that there are intense, uh, more intense frequency of visits. I mentioned the RH10 vector that carries the gene, and this treatment is given intravenously, like other treatments through an IV. The primary endpoint is safety and tolerability. That is, of course, the number one objective of any first in human study, is to determine the safety and tolerability. But there are other secondary endpoints, most important of which is CPET, peak VO2. CPET is cardiopulmonary exercise testing, I don't know, some of you may have uh, had this testing or have heard about it or seen it. It's sometimes done with a bicycle. In our case, it's done with an arm bicycle, arm uh, crank pedal, to measure exercise ability and gas exchange oxygen, carbon dioxide. We are also doing other assessments in this trial, one of which is cardiac biopsies. Uh, and that's important, and we do it before treatment and after treatment one time to ensure the safety of the treatment, as well as looking how much rituxin is actually being produced in the cells of the heart. And that's very important to understand the mechanism of the treatment, the dosing of the treatment, so we don't undertake that lightly, and we, of course, minimize any risk to the procedure being done in very experienced hands, and actually cardiac biopsy is part of a routine uh, assessment done in different cardiac diseases. But we are looking, of course, at various aspects of heart function, uh, an ability, symptoms of the heart, the cardiac mass, strain and ejection fraction, which Dr. Patel mentioned before, measurements of how well the heart is uh, pumping. We look at cardiac arrhythmias because that's another feature of the condition, and we do that with a patch that's worn for several days. We look at blood tests for the heart, as well as the neurologic scales that you are familiar with, have been mentioned, like MFARS. So it's a pretty comprehensive set of data that we will obtain from this relatively small study that will give us some early indication on the safety of the treatment as well as uh, effects on different measures of the heart. Just to go into a little more 
detail of the inclusion criteria. This isn't the whole list. I should say this is adults, so it's ages 18 to 40 uh, who have a diagnosis that uh, defined diagnosis with onset before age 25, and certain measurements uh, that are listed here that have to meet certain criteria to be included into the study in terms of the heart function and heart structure. Uh, and in terms of excluding patients, patients who really don't have the ability to do the testing, either MRI that's part of the test, or the CPET, or have other conditions, would be excluded because we want to make sure that this is the right population within the FA community to really be involved in this first study of this gene therapy. And uh, the last thing I want to show is where the sites are for the trial, the current sites, and there may be more in the future, but that's to be determined. Right now, there are four sites that are designated, one of which is already recruiting. So as uh, Jen had mentioned, this is a treatment uh, experimental treatment that has gone through the FDA IND process. They looked at all the animal data and said you can move into clinical trials. And the first site that is already open starting screening patients at UCLA. Uh, two other sites are at Mayo Clinic, University of Iowa, and the third site, uh, fourth site then, is Dr. Zezowitzin, University of South Florida. And these are sites that will be activated over the next few months so they can also uh, begin to enroll patients into the study. And I'll leave you with this email address. It's also lots of information on clinicaltrials.gov, as well as through FARA, and welcome people who are interested in learning more about the trial, either for themselves or people who may be interested in participating in reaching out. And I really appreciate your attention. Thank you very much. Well, I want to thank all of our panelists. Um, I'm going to just take a few minutes. Unfortunately, Dr. Ruiz from Laramar Therapeutics was supposed to join us, um, but she's not able to because um, her daughter is quite sick, um, and she's in the hospital, and so she's, I, I told her I would be happy to try and fill in for her um, so that we were not taking her away from her family. As I mentioned the other or earlier, we did do a webinar on Thursday evening on the Laramar program, so um, there's a lot more information that'll be on the website on Monday. Also, almost all of the programs you heard about today, we've done webinars on in the last six months, and so there, any of these, you can learn a whole lot more information from going to the clinical trial page of the website, and on for each of the programs, there's a link to each of the webinars. So CTI-1601 is a protein replacement therapy. So not replacing the gene, but replacing the protein. Um, and this is just a cartoon that shows you that the protein has attached to it a cell penetrating peptide, and that's the, the purple bar. And that's what helps the protein get into the cell and into the mitochondria. What's happened with the development of CTI-16 so far is that we completed a phase one study um, a little bit more than a year ago. And in the phase one study, um, there were two doses out of the three doses that were studied that showed that after seven days of dosing for taxin levels in cheek swab samples or in cheek cells of FA patients, um, elevated to the range of carrier or into the normal range. The next step is a phase two study where they're going to look at lower doses, so 25 milligrams of CTI 1601, but dosed for a longer period of time. And so this schematic shows you what the next trial looks like. And so you get dosed with CTI 1601 every day for 14 days, and then every other day out to day 28. And so this phase two study is gonna be looking at safety for longer term dosing, as well as what happens to frataxin levels and CTI 1601 over that period of time. Um, the, the study will begin with just one cohort 
So one dose cohort at 25 milligrams, but because they want to study 12 to 15 people with FA, it's going to be divided into two groups. Each group will get the same dose, they'll get the, the same um, protocol, but just for size management, people management, it's divided into two groups. So I know that was causing some confusion for folks in the webinar, so I wanted to try and help clarify that. After the 25 milligram, they'll look at the data, they'll share the data with the FDA, and it's very likely after that we'll need to go back to another cohort. Um, and, but all of that will be communicated once we, we have that information. Um, the study is enrolling individuals over the age of 18. Again, there's more information on the website about the detailed enrollment criteria. Um, I know Kim is here from Larimar as well. She's sitting right in front of me. Um, and Kim can also answer questions during the break. So with that, um, I think we can open it up for questions to our panelists. Um, and while people are raising their hand and Ron's running the mic, I just wanted to thank um, all of our panelists. Um, I think it's really exciting that all of you are here. All of these are clinical stage programs. I feel like next year, Jamie, we need a longer stage. Um, <laughs> we're gonna run out of room, which is a great problem to have. Um, you know, we know that treatments for FA, we're not gonna be one and done. All of these treatments are important. There isn't a single condition that we know of that's treated with one single treatment. All of these are complementary, and you know, eventually, as Ron likes to say, we're gonna have a cocktail. And we believe that you know, having a diverse and deep approach to treatment is what's gonna get us to our ultimate goal. All right, Jake. Hi, my name is Jake Tompkins. I've been a participant in clinical trials since 2013. Um, I was proposed a question by a member of the community. I didn't have an answer for them, and hopefully someone on this panel can answer it. Um, their question was, if they get their trial, their child enrolled in a trial, how can the company discern whether a side effect is coming from the COVID vaccine or coming from the trial drug? And I didn't know how to answer them, so I had them get in touch with Cora and with Dr. Lynch. Mm -hmm. So if we can come up with some kind of answer, That'd be great. So I, th I think the question is kind of how do you discern what adverse events or drug are drug related versus related to other things that might be happening for the person like COVID or COVID vaccines? Dr. Kim, you wanna <laughs> give it? I, you nodded first, so. Oh, oh, you said that you treat me kind and gentle like these slides, so. <laughs> But Jake, uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, maybe it comes in, my response comes in two parts. We actually uh, needed to assess this very question for our first in human trials. I mean, in an ideal world, you want the perfect background, but that doesn't happen. You know, we realize that there's a substantial number of FA patients who are, who are not vaccinated when we would have loved for them to have been vaccinated. So. Uh, Turns out there's a lot of enthusiastic patients who want to participate who are not vaccinated. So we removed that inclusion criteria out for a requirement for vaccines. Now that does pose that question that you had raised. Um, the good news is that the adverse event profile of COVID vaccines are well described. So uh, the investigator can take their best judgment for what had been seen in that adverse event profile versus anything new that could be related with, that could be potentially related with a drug. So um, further to your point, Jake, um, we have to meet patients where they are, not where we wish them to be. <laughs> so, um, and it, it does rely upon uh, investigator judgment, but also uh, we have the uh, advantage of having a well-described adverse event profile for the vaccinations. Excellent, excellent. The person's question was, that I couldn't answer it like, 
if you have to meet all these exclusion criteria to do a trial, that's fine. And if anything comes up, you know, we completely deal with it and start doing trials. But, like, if something comes up, how do you know where it came from? Did it come from the vaccine? And did it come from the experimental drug you're taking? One, you're doing a clinical trial. One, we, everybody just cause. Like, everything got forced to be, Like, all the clinical trials we do take years and years and years of data collection. That's great. But the vaccine just got forced to, forced to be. Like, dude, I don't have a damn for you. I don't know what to tell you, but all I can do is put you in touch with people who might know. So if you could answer a question, like, what discern the difference? I know that you removed that inclusion crit criteria, and that's great, for, but, like, I still couldn't answer this guy's question. Question: If there is no answer, that's fine. Maybe like, hey man, we don't have an answer for you. But if you have an answer, I'd love to hear it. So I know Dr. Lynch wants to try and answer this right. question. Okay. I've I've seen him like ready to jump out of his seat to answer this question, and and I think that's important because a lot of times adverse events do get assessed by our clinicians, yeah. not by the people working in the companies. Uh, as appropriate, because we clinicians theoretically have no vested interest <laughs> other than to make things work as safe and as, as possible. So there is a paradigm in any study for whether something which is seen, we're not talking about COVID vaccines or anything, whether something, an adverse event which is seen is related to drug or not. It's based on uh, the temporal relationship to drug, did it come after you gave the drug, for example, and how closely. It depends on what the event in. Is it seen commonly in FA? Is it seen never in FA? Has it been seen before with the drug? Has it never been seen before with the drug? And then we rated them as uh, no, unlikely, possible, likely, certain. And that's all taken into account. Usually when something, and, it'll, and how you act at that point, as our friends on the stage will, depends on the severity and the likelihood. Usually the first time you see something which just comes out of nowhere, it's possible it might be related to drug, but you, it's going to be more likely to be considered unlikely, particularly if it's not particularly severe. But when you see two, coincidences happen with one. With two, it still could be coincidence. With 15, it's not coincidence. So that's the way it would be drugged, and that's the way something would be judged if it were thought to be a distant effect of COVID uh, vaccine. I will note, the side effects of vaccines are, in general, extremely well known. And everything they've talked about here, novel drug class, pretty novel drug class, novel drug class, novel drug class, gene therapy, essentially new drug class. So there are more unknowns than you have for a COVID vaccine. <laughs> so Jim, probably I can provide maybe additional information uh, from a clinical development perspective. So when we run the phase three trial, as I described our reticulum, we have placebo controlled trial, right? The number of patients, large number of patients, at the end of the day, we're going to know actually, is this really, mm. you know, because we are blinded, clinicians are blinded during the trial, and at the end of the day, we're going to reassess, okay, any of whatever the AE is, is it really to drug, not really drug, based on the assessment as well. Yeah, yeah that is a, I'm really glad you brought that up. Um, that is one of the important features of a placebo-controlled trial. Even though everybody wants no placebo, that helps us answer that exact question you just asked, Jake, because if you have a placebo group, you would expect to see non-drug-related events in that group as well. So, next question. Hi, Steve Somerville. Thank you very much for being here and speaking with us this morning. Um, the question I have, Payal, you mentioned the term launch. And I'm wondering if you could expand on what that means or anybody, what is inclusive in the launch, and then once launching starts, maybe how long it takes to get to the general population so we can use it. Thank you. Sure. 
I will do my very best to answer that question in as compliant detail as I can. <laughs> <laughs> so what RIATA means by launch is, let's say, best case scenario, FDA gives us the green light for approval come <laughs> February 2023. Launch means we are going to be gearing up our sales force to get out there and speak to clinicians like the Dr. Lynch's out there. We are going to be ensuring that manufacturing is ramping up of the product, and we're gonna be ensuring, now mind you, when I say this, this is also all happening currently as we speak, but we're, we also have to be very mindful of the steps because we are waiting for that final response from the FDA. So launch, the third component of that launch will also be what does it mean for the patients and the family members like you to get it into your hands? How is the physician going to write the prescription? Where is that prescription going to go? Is it going to go to a specialty pharmacy? Uh, will it require prior authorizations? That whole process is currently taking place right now internally uh, to you know, iron out the fine details so that when we're ready to have the drug on market, it can be a very streamlined process to get to the community. Uh, in terms of, you know, FDA says, yes, approved, good to go, and the time it will take to actually physically get the drug to you, there might be some lag time, so I do have to level set and set some expectations there, but there may be some lag time. Unfortunately, I don't know what that lag time looks like at this point in time. Don? Oh, sorry. My question concerns the two trials increasing for taxin levels, and the last one was the Laramar, and the first one, I believe, was a, um, design therapeutics. What's the difference in the approach between entering the mitochondria on those? Or am I probably missed it? <laughs> So I'll, I'll speak to the Laramar one, and then I'll let Jay um, explain the gene tax. So the CTI-1601 is for taxin protein itself. So it's the protein gets made synthetically, and it gets a, a cell-penetrating peptide or a carrier molecule linked to it that allows it to get into the cell and into the mitochondria. And the frataxin protein over time will get degraded, and that's why it has to be readministered uh, multiple times. Thanks, Jen. Um, I, I think the simple way for me um, is that you know, uh, what Jen described was a therapeutic that, is, that provides exogenous frataxin. But what design therapeutics, investigational therapeutic uh, does is that it takes a broken protaxin gene and allows that gene to function normally. That is, you're expressing the body's own protaxin. Uh, and so uh, you know, the expansion repeats that stall the ability of a cell to make protaxin. That's what we bridge so that the body's own RNA is made, spliced, and then it actually produces its own final finished what's called messenger RNA that is no different from a normal protaxin RNA and an, the, own, the body's own protaxin protein. So uh, it's a, the design therapeutics method is des designed to uh, express the body's own protaxin gene. One other way I try and explain it is the, the gene tax um, are small, they're, they're molecules that go inside the cell to the gene itself and recruit all the machinery needed to go from gene to protein. And so that GA repeat sometimes makes some of that machinery kind of go away. It sends it away, it blocks it. And so the gene tag tries to kind of undo some of the uh, effects of the GA repeat and bring the machinery in. That's kind of how the drug is, is working. So uh, kind of a regulatory question that has recently come up with um, some of the group on FAPG, and that is, you know, you're, and, and it, I was trying to address it, but I think you guys are a better panel to do this, and it probably is going to need Dave too, 
but you have an age range on each of your trials that let's say the FDA does approve. So there was thick speculation that you can only give the drug to that age range or it's now generically approved, you know, barring adolescence. I mean, if you didn't do under 18, that's an issue. But I mean, if you stop at 40 in your drug trial, can a 60-year-old person take it? And so I just want people's feelings on that. Anybody on the panel want to take that? Oh, I'll take that. Go ahead, Jay. Uh, you know, it's up to the FDA, of course, and it depends what the data show. But it's not automatic but that the upper age is restricted by the age of the trial as much as the lower age is. And I think you made the point. You know, if the trial's an adult, then you would almost certainly have to study adolescents or children to have it approved for use in adolescents and children. Upper age is not, uh, again, the decision's up to the FDA, but not quite as strict uh, for upper age. There will be when, so when a drug goes through the review process at the FDA, a part of that process is deciding what goes on the label. And the label often um, is very similar to the clinical trials because that's the data you have. Um, and so sometimes the labels will be very restrictive or restricted to what was in the clinical trial. But then once a drug is approved, um, it's really the prescriber who decides who they're going to prescribe the medication for, okay? Um, and then the insurance payment is a whole nother thing, okay? But I think the important thing to also remember is for a lot of our drug development, yes, we're gonna have to start in a more restricted population to get the drug approved. And then we're gonna do additional trials, even of sometimes an approved drug, so that we can expand the label as we can study it in a broader population and understand its safety and efficacy in a broader population. And so, you know, Riata has mentioned that even with an approval, we can expect additional clinical trials, especially in children. And if there's a drug that's approved in children first, we'll, pro we'll expect later trials in adults um, as well. And so an approval doesn't mean the end of studying the drug or a complete restriction in terms of access over time. Dave, did you want to add to that? I, no, you, you said it very well. The, it's, it's a, the, if you go outside the label, it's prescriber, patient, and, un, and fortunately or unfortunately, insurance company, this is pragmatic description. I was going to mention that if I remember correctly, we have five silent individuals up here who, by law, have to remain silent on the topic of off-label yeah. use, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> particularly since this is a taped event. <laughs> I, I'm being quite serious there. They yeah. can't talk about it, even privately. Well, Jim, probably. So one thing I can talk about is really, you know, from a regulatory perspective, even though we study the age group, and regulators may say, okay, is this safe? And, and efficacy in other population, if you can justify, you can talk. But again, so that's the, you know, if not, we have to run another trial to, just like Jim said, we have to open, you know, uh, expand the age group and then make sure it's a safe and efficacy as well. You know, I know this is a regulatory question, it's also a clinical development question as well. So when you design the study, you have to understand the population first and then to justify, as I said, okay, this two key components. All right, we're gonna have to um, take a break now. Jamie, Jamie's giving me the signal. Um, where I know we're a few minutes over. Um, we're still gonna give you a 15 minute break because I know that Lane and I can make up a little bit of time during the next session. Um, we've both worked with Dr. Lynch, so we are skilled in talking really fast when we want to. Um, so thank you to all of our panelists and 15 minute break. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah.